Hello and welcome to another episode of Future Off. I am Azam Farqui with my co-host Vasi. Hey Vasi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Things are good? Well, things are good. I ha- I'm booked for my next first shot, so looking forward to it. Excellent. I got my vaccine 2 weeks ago, so I think uh I think my protection I'm told is is good. So I'm happy. What a oh, relief as well. Yes, thank, thank you. you. You know, it almost feels like that my parole application has been approved. So I kind of feel like what Morgan Freeman went through in Trash and Redemption every time he would go in with his application gets rejected, right? So, uh, so you finally uh, got in, which is good. I mean, yeah. I mean, we've talked we've talked extensively with uh, two doctors now about the pandemic. So uh, maybe there is an episode for a vaccine rollout one day in in, in hindsight. Uh, but today it's going to be a whole episode about space, uh, space exploration, and really the future of of that. So very excited for us to have the, that conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's a fun conversation because space always is cool. You see all these movies, you know, you've heard all these, um, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, people landing on moon, the Apollo program and Perseverance landing on Mars. But in addition to that, it's actually very important to our future as humans, right? And uh, what that means to us in the future, what how do we navigate this vast empty space, you know, emptiness of space and uh, what's next for us. So I think it's an, an, a very important topic as well. And uh, I'm very happy to say we have an amazing guest today. Um, quite a Renaissance person, I would say. She's a citizen mm-hmm. astronaut candidate with Project Possum. Uh, and if I'm reading all the credentials correctly, she's a physician, aquanaut, speaker, martial artist, advanced diver, skydiver, pilot in training, VP Immersive Medicine with Luxonic Technologies and Fellow of the Explorers Club. She's also the director of the International Institute of uh, Astronautical Sciences, uh, Chief Instructor of the IIAS Possum Operational Space Medicine Course, Director of Medical Research at Orbital Assembly Corporation, Clinical Lecturer at the University of Alberta, and she has her own podcast. She's a host of the World Extreme Medicine's WEMcast series primary investigator for the Shad Canada Blue Origin, uh, student microgravity competition, and appointed member of the Ascent 2021 Guiding Coalition, Life Sciences Team Lead for the Association of Space Flight Professionals, and sessional lecturer for the Technology <laughs> and Future of Medicine course at University of Alberta. I feel wholly inadequate talking to her right now. <laughs> me too, I would like me to too. welcome Dr. Shana Pandya uh, to our show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Pandya. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Absolutely amazing. Uh, And to Asim's point, you have uh, such an impressive and inspiring background. Uh, uh, First of all, uh, I I always get this question. She's like, where do you find the time to do all of this, which is amazing, but you don't have to answer that because it's it's fantastic. Uh, But you are also both a medical doctor and a, uh, I guess you said like an astronaut candidate. Is that, I guess, the the, the, the correct term? Yeah. scientist astronaut candidate. Um, uh, how did you end up becoming sort of an expert in both of these fields? And and my thing, given your, your amazing background is like, what drives your passions? Like what really uh, gets you going and, and wants you to excel in these, in these, in these two areas? Yeah, those are great questions. So like many kids, I wanted to be an astronaut growing up. I just never grew out of the dream. And, um, you know, I was tremendously inspired by Canada's first female astronaut in space, Dr. Roberta Bondar. So I really modeled my career after her. As I said, okay, she's a neuroscientist. I'm going to go be a neuroscientist. She's a physician. I'll be a neuro, or I'll be a physician. And then I just need to go be an astronaut. And it's as simple as that. And um, that's really what set me on the track down medicine. And it wasn't until I did my master's at the International Space University that I saw that, oh my gosh, space medicine is an entire branch of study. Um, you know, we need to keep humans and astronauts healthy in space when we send them there. And that's how I got interested in this whole field of medicine dedicated towards preventing hazards in space flight, as well as keeping astronauts not just surviving, but thriving in space. And that's the field of space medicine. Oh, yeah. So maybe just to start, I know there's a lot of different topics and issues that we can press upon in terms of the future of when it comes to space. But I really liked what you uh, mentioned was this idea of the future of space when it comes to medicine and sort Mm -hmm. of some of the uses of of technologies and and so forth. And I was wondering if you could maybe uh, 
expand upon that and some of the work that you're currently doing and what that future state of is? Yeah, sure. So when we talk about the future of human exploration, we're looking at a future of space that's more diverse and more inclusive and more ambitious than ever. And so when we look at, you know, the the more um, uh, inclusive part, you know, to date, only 12% of astronauts have been female, 1% have been black astronauts. Um, and now we talk about commercial space flight and the rise of sub- suborbital space flight with providers like Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, Blue Origins. We're saying that now anyone can fly um, you know, to le- low Earth orbit or to, to suborbital flight at least. And so then the question is, um, how do we maintain that accessibility? How do we lower the cost of accessing space? How do we maintain safety? Um, when we talk about the um, diversity and inclusion aspect, how do we, you know, if we say we're going to space for all of humanity, um, well, how do we do it with all of humanity? You know, how do we t- t- change that 12% into 50%? Um, And then finally, the ambitious aspect of it comes towards if we're talking about going to the moon and to Mars and beyond, well, there's a lot of medical challenges that come with that. So what kind of technologies do we need to support um, humans on Mars, knowing that Earth is a six to nine month journey away and we can't simply evacuate in case of a medical emergency? So can you expand a little bit more about that? So when we talk about that, so obviously distance is one and uh, before recording you had mentioned uh, you know the communication delay with mars potentially what are some of the things that uh, you know doctors or scientists would have to consider uh, when planning uh, you know or talking about space medicine can you give us a few examples that you may have yeah. come across? That's a great question. So when we talk about the challenges of space flight, we talk about the big five. So those are briefly altered gravity environments, whether we're thinking about astronauts in microgravity on the International Space Station or at one sixth gravity on the moon, distance from Earth. So that's kind of that example where we talked about, you know, depending on how the Earth and Mars are aligned, it could be a three to 23 minute one way time delay. And so that's up to 46 minute time delay. So you have to that, that it, it translates into, if you're in a medical emergency, you cannot wait for instruction from Earth. You need to be able to act independently. We also talk about the increased radiation, the further away from Earth and the farther outside our magnetosphere and Van Allen belts we go, the more and higher energy radiation we're exposed to. Um, we talk about isolation and confinement. So you better be a, crew, a good crewmate because you don't want to be the one that's voted off the of spacecraft. We talk about those team dynamics. Um, and then finally, we talk about everything else, which falls under the umbrella term of hostile environments. So this includes altered day-night cycles. So for example, here we have a 24-hour day-night cycle. On the moon, that looks like 28 days, 14 days of day, 14 nights of night. Um, we talk about exposure to dust um, and lunar regolith. And you know we have hundreds of pages of documentation from the Apollo era that said all of this dust clogged up spacesuits. It was an irritant to the skin, to the lungs. So there's a lot of considerations. um, And the question is, how do we anticipate? How do we mitigate? How do we reduce that risk? And how do we keep our astronauts um, not just surviving, but thriving on the surface of Moon, Mars, and beyond? Awesome. And so what would be some of the things that um, you would look at in terms of those technologies to help to support that type of uh, future space medicine, like our, and, and I, I'm, I'm curious actually, like, is it, is it things that you study here on earth or is it the things that we're studying in Mars or, or is it a combination of both? That's a great question. Um, you know, I love talking about this stuff because, you know, it's part of it's futuristic, part of it's sci-fi, part of it's here and now. And so when we talk about the challenges of the space flight, it's not just all of those health hazards that I listed. It's also, also the challenges of packing for space. So when we look at what we can bring with us, we call it the backpacking principle. Because if we're going on a hike, everything we put in our backpack comes at the expense of every of something else. And so, you know, if we put in a five pound survival kit, well, maybe that takes up half our space. Um, and, you know, we only have a 10 pound weight allotment in what we can carry in our backpack. It's the same with packing for space. We're mass constrained, volume constrained, cost constrained. Um, Whatever we use has to um, adhere to the power budget. Um, It has to be easy to use, have a long shelf life. Um, And so then that translates into, you know, what medications can we bring with us? Um, What can we pack into our space medicine kit? 
Um, and so then it, the question becomes, knowing these constraints, knowing these challenges, what technologies can help us along the way? Um, so, for example, we talked about at the beginning of this in my intro that I work with a VR company called Luxonic Technologies. And the way I got in, involved with that company is through space medicine. Um, and so, you know, one of the identified threats to crew performance is the deterioration of skills on a long duration mission to the moon or to Mars or beyond. Um, so imagine you're the crew medic. The first time you learned to put an IV in was on Earth. And then suddenly the next time you're called to use that skill is maybe 16 months later on the surface of Mars. You're going to be rusty and odds are your patient is going to look like a pincushion. So what if you had the opportunity to practice those skills in a way that respected your packing constraints? And that's where technologies like virtual reality come in. And so what we've done is partner with the Canadian Space Agency and develop modules for medical procedural skills training in VR. Other examples of technologies are artificial intelligence to help the sole crew doctor with their decision making. Um, 3D printing. So being you can't take it with you, but maybe you can print an important medical device or part in situ uh, without needing to pack it with you first. Um, getting a little bit more sci-fi, you know, there's uh, there's thoughts of saying, well, if gravity is so harmful to our bones and our muscles, well, why not just hack the system and provide gravity? So that's kind of what we're working on with Orbital Assembly Corporation, providing spinning space stations that can um, generate at least some of the gravity that we would have on Earth. Um, what about being more sci sci-fi? There's proposals that kind of borrow from the movie Gattaca and say, well, what if we just spliced protective genes into humans and made them resistant to radiation, for example? Um, and so there's a great paper out of the MIT Review that says, well, what if we theoretically spliced elephant genes into humans? And the idea isn't to make a the elephant man. It's because elephants don't get cancer because they have four copies of the um, of cancer editing genes. And so what if we splice those cancer editing genes into humans, knowing we're sending them into a higher radiation environment? Um, even human hibernation has been looked at. There's companies out there, there's researchers out there looking at that. Um, you know, there's, there's research, the Alaska Institute of, uh, of Biology has looked at, well, if ground schools, squirrels can hibernate and they only use 1% of their metabolic rate, we can save on resources. How do we translate that into non-hibernating species? The European Space Agency has con conducted studies on this. So basically, if you can dream it, no matter how how sci-fi it seems, these wow. are solutions wow. that are seriously being looked at to you know help humans expand and do so safely beyond the, the cradle of Earth. Wow! And um, you mentioned that interesting that interesting work around of virtual reality. Is that something, is it, is it like outside of the realm of possibility that you could use that virtual reality when you're maybe trying to fix or mend somebody in space? Like, I don't, you know how they sometimes are, or you have, um, I'm not sure how to describe it from a medical standpoint, but you've got a surgeon working on somebody, but they're working remotely and it's done through, you know, a technology. Yeah. Like, do you think that that's something that we could bridge the gap in terms of, uh, when you're in space versus when you're here on Earth? Yeah, what you're describing is telerobotics and telesurgery, and that's a, a great field of study. Um, I was lucky enough to work on the first neurosurgical robot that was actually, um, so a robot that does brain surgery that had been built on the same technologies that power the Canada arm, that robotic arm in space. Um, and so this is a very um, uh, you know fascinating field of study. Um, there have been there have been studies uh, looking at how over what distance we can do this. So, for example, when we talk about practicing for space, we talk about practicing in analogous or analog environments. And one of those environments is called the Aquarius Three Space, an underwater research facility in the Florida Keys, where NASA runs its NEMO or NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations missions. And um, about a decade or so ago, um, a Canadian physician called Dr. Anvari managed to run a tele-robotic uh, or telesurgery um, uh, procedure in which he, sitting in, uh, in McMaster University, managed to control a robot under the water to perform surgery uh, at Aquarius Reef Base. So it's something that's being worked oh, wow. on. When we talk about the practicalities of giving a command to a robot performing surgery on Mars that may be 23 minutes away, it becomes less practical. 
So then we have to talk about, well, how do we empower whoever's doing surgery on Mars to make the right and safe decisions for their patients? Awesome. And one of the things that occurs to me, so when we look back at the Apollo program, some of the technologies that were developed for Apollo ended up uh, rolling out in our normal day-to-day -day lives, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. the computing power, cell phones, all that stuff. So based on what you're telling us, it seems like that some of it could have a lot of implications for humans on Earth as well, right? Especially telerobotic um, surgeries and things like when you're talking about, especially in Canada, there are a lot of people that live in remote areas. So can you talk to us a little bit more about when, you, when we talk about these technologies uh, developing purely for space, how can it impact the humanity back home as well? That's a great question. I've literally written a book chapter on, so the, we call these spin-off technologies and I've written a book chapter on space medicine technologies that had been spun off to benefit everyday medicine on earth. I call the book chapter from orbit to OR. Um, and there's, you know, there's myriad examples, whether we're talking about, um, you know, breast cancer imaging, which has benefited from an unlikely source charged couple devices on the Hubble telescope to make breast cancer imaging higher resolution, less painful. We've used sensors, um, biomonitoring sensors that have been used on astronauts on the International Space Station to monitor infants, to be aware of, uh, you know, the risk of sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. Um, we've used atmospheric scrubbers that help keep the atmosphere cleaner um, on the ISS to help um, uh, lengthen the shelf life of produce during the food transport chain. There's so many examples out there, even with the virtual reality work that I described with Luxonic, um, you know, we're, we're very earth minded as well, you know, especially during the pandemic when we've lost access to our traditional training spaces in medicine and healthcare. And so we actually also develop procedural um, and medical education and guidance for nurses, paramedics, doctors, any manner of healthcare worker. Um, and the idea is, you know, what does the ISS have in common with a remote Arctic village mm -hmm. in Canada? And both are remote and resource limited. And that's why, um, you know, we learn a lot of lessons from space that can be applied to our most resource constrained environments on Earth and vice versa. There's also a spin in application to help maintain and make space medicine better um, and more supportive of astronaut health. Awesome. awesome. Now, you also did a tour at the Mars uh, Desert Research uh, Station, right? So for our listeners and our viewers, can you, first of all, explain what Mars Desert Research Station is? And, and also, can you talk a little bit about what that entailed and how that work features into the future space travel exploration uh, with planet Mars? Absolutely. And so this comes back to our, our initial talk about what an analog environment is. And so when we talk about an analog environment, we are trying to in some way replicate the fidelity of the space environment because space is hard, space is expensive, and space is trying to kill us. We don't want the first time we practice something in space to be in space. And that's where the value of all these places, whether we're talking about the Aquarius Reef base where NASA runs its NEMO missions, parabolic flight where we can simulate periods of zero G for 20 to 30 seconds at a time, or in this case, the Mars Desert Research Station. And so I've been lucky enough to do two rotations there. Um, first is the crew medical officer, once as commander. Uh, I like to call it real life on fake Mars um, because you're essentially living and working as a crew as if you were on Mars. So you are in this little tin can with your crew of six to eight people. You better get along really well. Otherwise, it's going to be an uncomfortable two weeks. Um, and you're bringing your science with you. You're des designating your operational schedule. You're performing EVAs or extravehicular activities, which are like um, exploratory activities outside of the, um, the habitat. Um, and more than that, uh, you know, anytime you go out of the, the hab, um, you're suiting up because you are on Mars. And if you didn't, you, that, the atmosphere would kill you. Um, and then you're privy to these amazing sprawling red vistas of um, these amazing rocky terrains that really make you feel as if you were on Mars. And so it's supposed to replicate the science, um, you know, do technology demonstrations and also engage in exploration um, that did, that um, we these are kind of the value we derive from places like MDRS. 
Cool. And then based on based on that, I mean, you, you do that to sort of mimic what Mars is like. And so what what would be sort of the takeaway, like the the future state of are we looking to want to colonize Mars? Are we looking to set it up in a way where we can sort of replicate um, our life on Earth where people could could live there? Or would we use it more for for research or further sort of space exploration? You know, that's a great question. That's a subject of, you know, intense discussion in the space community, community now. Um, and it depends on who you ask. We have, we have you know, dedicated space ethicists so as to res- respect, um, to explore space in a way that's respectful and environmentally um, protective. Um, and even, you know, the way we talk about space has changed. We, we no longer use the word um, colonize um, because of the implications and it, its ties to the past. We talk about human settlements. When we talk about, we don't use the term manned missions anymore. We use human human or crude exploration. Um, and so that's kind of a push towards where we're headed with space. When we talk about the best model, that's a subject of intense debate. How do we not repeat the mistakes of the past? How do we engage in respectful governance? What um, uh, ethics, what morals, what laws, what governance systems do we bring with us? You know, there's even um, ethicists who look at for historical protection of the Apollo lunar sites and say, how do we, um, you know, go about engaging in lunar exploration um, in a way that's historically um, protective of what we've done in the past? And then the question, you know, that we might ask from there is, well, how how far do we expand that? Because up to a point, everything we do on the moon will be a first. And so how much is that is going to be protected? How much of that should be protected? Um, and so these are some of the future forward questions we have to engage in. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to think about now rather than going ahead, engaging in exploration early on and then saying, well, you know, we were actually quite destructive. We've contaminated our ability to explore um, the Martian environment in a way that can actually definitively say there's life or not because we didn't appropriately decont- decontaminate before arriving on the surface of Mars, for example. Great. And just to follow up on that, especially when you talk about, uh, you know, potential governance, if you're talking about human settlements and, you know, it's important to start these conversations. Now, there's an emerging area where there's been democratization and we're seeing a lot of private companies, uh, you know, coming into play as well. SpaceX obviously has a stated mission of landing a human being on Mars. Uh, Blue Origins there, Virgin Galactic wants to do commercial uh, space flights as well. How do these private companies fit in with the governance models and the whole ethics of settlement and being respectful of, um, you know, Mars's environment and um, e- like even Moon's environment for, for that matter? Uh, because, I mean, they on one side, they do bring a lot of value because they have, like, for example, SpaceX has maybe lowered the cost a lot for NASA uh, in terms of, uh, you know, moving um, a lot of... Uh, um, I would say items to the International Space Station, which they've done on behalf of a lot of companies. That, well, countries they've also launched some satellites, uh, and you know it's been a lot cheaper for a lot of countries as well. But when we talk about private companies going in and you know talking about human settlements, how does that governance ethics come into play? Yeah, so that's a great question because there is a little bit of um, precedence for establishing at least some models of governance. And so in the 60s, we had the Outer Space Treaty, we had the Moon Treaty, um, you know, essentially saying that, yes, we're in a cold war, but how do we play nice with space? How do we, you know, establish that this should be a place for um, peaceful and scientific exploration? Um, What kind of laws do we apply? Of course, we also have to respect that not everyone signed on to that. Um, that there's new major space powers, um, the nature of uh, who goes to space because it's still government signing. Um, so now how do we in how do we regulate private entities going? Because um, you know, it's as you say, um, right now SpaceX is very motivated and has been saying for a few years now that they want to put humans on Mars um, within the decade. Um, so if that's the case, and you know even even the um, the manner in which they propose to go about doing that is, you know, we're going to send many, many people, many of you will die, we're prepared to take that risk, you know, what are the ethics of that? And so this is, 
an evolving conversation, but it's one we need to be mindful of because again, we, you know, human history is not without many, many mistakes we've made. And so we need to look at those mistakes when it comes to settlement, when it comes to respectful use of land, when it comes to um, ethical treatment of human life, when it comes to respectful exploration. Okay. And maybe just to build on that, I have, I guess more of it, it's more of a sort of personal opinion question. It is really sort of the future goal or expectation that we look at human settlements on things like, I don't know, Mars, uh, the moon, like, and what, what, what's really the motivation of these private companies to sort of democratize space travel? Like that's really kind of what I, what I struggle with, you know, in terms of what really do we, what, what's the future and state of where we want to get to when we look at this type of space exploration or space travel? Yeah. And right. That's a great question right now. When we look at the roadmaps towards the moon and Mars right now, we're still seeing um, private public partnerships. So for example, um, plans to go back to the moon with the Artemis missions are, you know, making use of, uh, of private entities like SpaceX, for example, to provide uh, lunar lunar landers, for example, or l- lunar launch vehicles. Um, and but the the mission determinants and objectives will be made by by NASA and its and its partners like the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. Um, so for, for now, the mandate of these missions is still science, exploration, um, technology demonstrations, and establishing a, a permanent uh, peaceful operation, permanent peaceful operations on the moon. Um, so the question that we have to extrapolate is exactly as you say, Vasi, um, how, you know, say, say a private entity has the ability to go to Mars. Um, and lay their claim there and fly their company flag there. Um, we really need to start thinking about that now because, you know, the landscape of how do we can access space is changing exponentially. Um, and it, it's something to be, it, it, it's, it's not, it's not um, unfathomable that it can simply be a private entity at this point. And, and the fact is that, I mean, we, we're past the point or gone are the days when governments can just shut private entities down because they do offer a lot of value, right? I mean, like reusing rockets, for example, like and all these things, they've done a lot of good work as well. So I guess it's just about how do governments and, you know, I, I guess that's somewhere where you have to have a collaborative effort between countries as well. How do you have a framework that allows these private entities to continue to explore while stay within the stated guidelines to a certain extent some of the policy framework is evolving there was for example the uh, 2004 commercial um u.s commercial space act so there is recognition that there is a role for commercial enterprise um there were the artemis accords in the past two years or so so um you know there are evolving frameworks um these are these are u.s based and so then the question is how do we get international buy-in that also respects all comers, realizing that there's, uh, you know, every single day there's a brand new National Space Agency um, emerging. And, you know, some of these have um, incredible people power, incredible track records. When you look at what uh, the Indian Space Research Organization, Israel is doing with um, un- uncrewed um, uh, and robotic uh, exploration, um, you know, they've they've accomplished a lot. The UAE has sent to um, and China have now sent um, rovers to Mars. Um, so it's 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 a very complex. And even you know, even myself being a non-space policy expert um, or a non-expert, I should say, uh, you know, it's it's still critical to be aware of how the framework is evolving. And you know, the other part of that is recognizing my responsibility as being. Um, someone who's very involved with and cares a lot about space exploration. If I see something that I don't um, agree with or that raises alarms about how to maintain respect, respectful and responsible exploration of space, then it's kind of up to me to also be part of that conversation. 
Um, I wanted to sort of take an opportunity to uh, go back to what you said at the beginning of the podcast. We talked about the importance of inclusion, diversity, representation of women. Uh, I know you personally, you know, trailblaze in a lot of respects uh, as a woman in this space. Um, I know that we've never actually had a woman astronaut um, land on the moon. And as part as a uh, part of uh, the Artemis program, I know that the goal is to hopefully have one by uh, 2024. But I really wanted to get a sense from you, like, what do you see the the future of space exploration in the context of women and, and their role more and more emerging in this space? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's so many amazing women who have paved the way, who have you know been the best in their field. Um, you know, and it's it's long past due. Um, it's long past due that we have women on the moon, and you know, a critical part of space exploration going forward. You know, we have the trailblazers like Sally Ride and Valentina Tereshkova, um, and it's our our job now is you know, if we're going to space for all of humanity, then let's do it with all of humanity. Um, let's do it with gender parity. Let's do it respecting um, the diversity of cultures and ethnicities that are out there. Let's do it with the LGBTQ community. Um, so that's the other part of human exploration is, well, let's bring all humans into it. Great. And then, so I, I, I know that there was this really interesting story about that. And I think it was in 2019 where um, uh, there was announced that there would be a first all female space crew. Uh, but then there were issues in terms of sort of the sizing and the fit, you know, of, of the spacesuits. And I know the spacesuits are in the millions of dollars and it's very technical and, and all of that. How do you think, you know, based on what you were talking about in terms of diversity inclusion, um, this field is adapting to the, the changing sort of not only gender needs, but sort of inclusionary needs of space travel. Yeah, with the space, suits, it was a little bit of a tricky situation because the fit um, of that particular astronaut had changed. And like we said earlier, this podcast, space is risky, space is hard, space is expensive. And if we see a risk and an opportunity to mitigate a risk, in this case, providing the best fit spacesuit um, to be able to perform the work needed because spacewalks are hard. This is eight hours of working um, in a pressurized suit. I've been in a pressurized suit, not for eight hours, but, you know, for a, up to an hour at a time. And it is hard work. And, um, you know, you're, you're working very hard. You're kind of um, be staying hydrated through whatever um, uh, replenishment you have in your spacesuit. Um, and so, when knowing that you're going into such a hard environment, you want to stack all the cards in your favor. Um, and so in this particular case, it was it was an unpopular decision, as we saw in the media, but it was ultimately mm -hmm. the right decision. But then the question becomes, how do we make sure that we're providing the best fit for all astronauts? And um, because knowing the origins of human spaceflight, it was a product of the Cold War. And as um, a byproduct of that, the first astronauts were very homogeneous. They were male Caucasian military pilots. And you, as you can imagine, they have a bit of a different physical build, physic a bit of a different physical build um, than say, you know, you or me. Um, so then the question becomes is how do we, our spacesuits need to adapt to be able to um, accommodate someone who may be of, of a different size? Um, and this is something we run into all the time. You know, at the Mars Desert Research Station, I would constantly say to my my fellow uh, uh, crewmate, crewmates when we would go out on the EVA because we were strapped in these backpacks that were one size fits all. And I would say, man, I wish I had the shoulders of a man because I certainly don't. Um, you know, even in medicine, when um, I'm using surgical tools, I, I don't have the palms of a man. And so grasping a, a surgical tool is um, a little bit more challenging. Even when we look at temperature, um, you know, when people say, well, women are always cold. Well, we know that women metabolize differently than men and that their that comfort level is different than that of a man. So they're always cold because the work office environment isn't engineered for them. So now that we've identified these problems and acknowledged them, the question is, how do we make it better? 
Right. And do you think that's really more and more what a lot of, you know, space exploration will take into account is we, we know that we've got to be a lot more uh, inclusionary. We have all of these different factors. We know that from a scientific perspective. So do you really think moving forward, we'll see more of that adapted into a lot of these programs and initiatives and, and how, like, fundamentally speaking, even how we outfit um, uh, yeah. space? It, it has to be. It absolutely has to be part of the, the conversation, not just on space, but on everyday occurrences in Earth. We can't just say, yeah, we're inclusive, but not mean it. You know, it's one thing to say that we believe in making making an environment a space for everyone. But then we also have to you know, put our money where our mouths are and say, here are the steps we've taken. And here's how we are making this environment. This is how we're engineering this environment for you to succeed. So moving on a little bit. So we've generally when we talk about space exploration, we talk about in terms of, you know, putting humans on moon, Mars, you know, we've talked about, you know, the operational challenges. So whether it's medicine, there are a lot of other factors, but we see a, a lot of other things that go on as well, right? I know NASA has sent probes, you know, for example, the voyages that have left, you know, our solar system. Um, and we're starting to hear about things like asteroid mining. So, what else is going on when we talk about future exploration that, you know, most people wouldn't know or understand or wouldn't even think about? This is a great question. Um, and I have an entire t TED Talk dedicated to this called Discovering Exploration. And the question I like to ask is, you know, what happens when we democratize access to space? What happens when space is no longer just for the pilots and the researchers and the engineers but we make mm -hmm. space for the artists, the entrepreneurs, and athletes as well. Um, what can we achieve? And space mining, you know, accessing, making precious rare metals ubiquitous um, is, you know, one of those consequences. Um, what else can we develop? What kind of new art forms? What kind of entertainment forms? What kind of businesses? Um, you know, what, what else can we achieve? And that's why it's so critical to be talking about catalyzing access to space. Um, you know, coming specifically back to your question about space mining, the reason that people are interested in this is because it proposes to access trillions of dollars worth of um, precious space metals and then bring them back to to Earth for humanity's use. Um, and so this is why it's worth entertaining these discussions of well, what can we achieve once we make when we overcome the access. Yeah, I know. Um, I think it was Jeff Bezos. He once said that in an ideal future, what he would envision, and, and I know it, this is very, very futuristic, is that all the manufacturing that, you know, anything that has a negative impact on climate change, that kind of work can be done outside of Earth and you bring it back and, you know, so that you sort of save the Earth, you know, you know from de deteriorating even further. I mean, obviously, this is real, real sci-fi at this point, uh, but it's just interesting, you know. Obviously. Kind of, but we need to we need to approach such thoughts with more nuance. It, the thought can't be as simple as saying, "Well, we're just going to do it elsewhere, so we don't screw up Earth." Well, we can't. We have to, <laughs> right? have to realize, yeah. acknowledge the undertone that it's okay to screw up an asteroid. We still, if we're going to mine asteroids, we still have to think about the consequences of the environmental disruption to that particular environment. And we have to weigh the benefits uh, as well as the, the downsides of disrupting another space environment that we're laying claim to. Uh, and so, you know, when we have thought leaders um, with a lot of power and with a lot of following, um, musing about the future, I, I, I really encourage us to delve deeper and have the nuanced conversation conversation about what about the land of unintended consequences um, because these are amazing feats of human um, intelligence and human accomplishment that we're proposing um, but it also nothing we've done has ever been without consequence and we also need to learn from learn from that um, in the past where you know whatever we've achieved with large-scale mining um, large-scale uh, manufacturing we need to realize that there have been downsides and we need to make sure that we're going forward in a way that shows we've learned from those mistakes. 
Interesting. Your um, um, medical background, I know, and you've done a lot of work on um, psychological resiliency, and you look at that in terms of uh, long haul space flights, uh, and and as well as the impact of of space and from a medical uh, standpoint. I was wondering if you were able to, uh, or if if you found, are there some parallels or if you can draw any to um, well, what a lot of us have sort of experienced the past year and a half during a lockdown as, as part of this pandemic. I know it can't be exactly, you know, uh, similar to being in space, you know, but a lot of us as human beings have never really been put in a situation where we're told you have to stay at home, only socialize with a handful of people for an extended period of time. And for a lot of us, it's been like almost a year and a half. Um, do you think that there are any learnings from what, you know, you study and look at that we can apply here and and how we can become more resilient, I guess, moving forward. Yes, absolutely. Um, And so this is another one of the book chapters I've written, and it's all about psychological resilience and long duration spaceflight. And in putting that chapter together, it wasn't just about the data that we have from astronauts on previous missions. It looked at any manner of individual who managed to excel in an austere, isolated, confined, extreme environment, whether it was deployments to Antarctica, military deployments, submarine crews. And the commonality is we're all, we're, we're away from our usual creature comforts. There's no Starbucks on Mars. There's yeah. ostensibly no Starbucks on a submarine. Um, and so one term that's incredibly powerful um, in this, this field of positive psychology is salidogenesis. And it looks at these humans who rise to the occasion when faced with this kind of Um, challenge and austerity. And it's the kind of person who views this as an opportunity for self-growth and self-fulfillment. And the cool thing about resilience or mental fortitude or toughness or grit is that it's not something that we're born with. It's not that, Vasi, you're more resilient than I am. and I can never hope to get up to that level. It's a learned trait. Then it can be broken down into key components. And it really depends on which source you go to Um, But, you know, the one that I like to quote says that, you know, the traits we need to um, constantly apply, practice and grow are positive self-talk, telling yourself that you've got this, positive social uh, support networks, relying on your your, um, psychosocial supports, impulse control, resisting the urge to give up, mental rehearsal, and then breaking things down. And so there is a way to approach resilience and tough environments, whether you're talking about enduring COVID-19 or spaceflight. Um, and there's a way to to grow and rise to the, the austerity of the occasion. And, and, and just to that, um, I, I know you've mentioned um, uh, the book that you've written. Is can, can you provide the name for our listeners? And we'll put a link on. Uh, on yeah, the- sure. Um, so this was a book chapter in a um, in I believe it's the Handbook of Space. Uh, what is it? The Handbook of uh, Extraterrestrial and Space Life Habitats. Don't quote me on that. I'll send you the link afterwards. Um, um, but I can certainly provide the access to that that textbook. Perfect. And we'll also link to that talk at the end. So. Yeah. And I'm also curious just to um, expand upon that. Uh, it's more of a question of curiosity. Uh, people who train to go to space, um, I, I'm assuming you're tested for this type of resiliency and, the, and sort of that mental psychological capacity to be able to live very like, you know, in a very in very tight quarters for extended period of time. Uh, with, I'm assuming, a schedule that's that's very rigorous. And so um, why I'm asking that is that you mentioned that resiliency is not something we naturally necessarily have. It's something that we learn. So is that something, um, you know, you would be tested for to be able to qualify then to be, okay, she's ready. She's the type of person that could live in space for 18 months, let's say. Absolutely. So when we talk about mitigating risk, um, to human health in space. Um, we talk about also the psychological as well as the physiological and physical aspects. And this starts at selection. So there's certain medical um, uh, conditions that are screen out cri- criteria. And as well on the psychological aspect, there's certain um, screen in, screen out criteria. And NASA astronaut candidates, when they're going through selection, famously have to take a 600 um, question personality inventory. And it's, they ask the same questions in slightly subtle ways. So you can't game the system. And the, the, essentially, they want to look for, well, are you a sociopath? Um, because that's a screen out criteria. 
um, certain mental health disorders um, are a screen out criteria, but they also want to look for the people that you really want in your corner in a tough situation. Um, so the ones that are very team team based, who are mission focused, um, who you know are easy to get along with. So absolutely, the psychology plays a critical role um, in astronaut selection. Fascinating. Fascinating. I don't know if I could handle a six hundred uh, questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when you say you know that you, you build resiliency so from your experience how do people so let's say talk about people in everyday lives and they're already going through a lot of challenges right now how do you build resiliency absolutely so i think the first thing for me that's helpful is knowing that you know this is something that we can build up it's like it's like a muscle that you know with work and investment we can build up um, I think knowing those five components um, really helps, you know, give one, give me at least a focused way of saying, what am I going to cultivate today? So, for example, going through a rough time, um, you know, relying on uh, positive social supports. You know, this is this wasn't something that I grew up doing. I always thought, well, you know, I have to overcome this on my own. And it was more it's more in professional and adult life saying that, you know, it actually takes a lot of courage to say Maybe I don't have this um, and maybe who can help me with this? Um, you know, so that's a very practical way. If you're struggling in the COVID pandemic and saying, OK, well, what can I do to help myself endure? Maybe it's as simple as calling a friend and saying, OK, I'm struggling a bit today. Um, maybe it's the impulse control, giving in the urge to do something bad, whether it's, you know, not caving into junk food, um, not hitting the bottle as hard. Or even not being hard on yourself if you try to engage in something but fail, quote unquote, fail. So even if it's something like cigarette smoking, uh-huh. you've fallen off the wagon, you've started smoking again. That's not an end all be all. That's not final. You have plenty of time to try again. Um, uh-huh. So I think I think that's it's critical to know those components, but also practicing self forgiveness um, <laughs> is really important. Well, thank you so much uh, for speaking to us today. I actually have sort of a fun question I was hoping to ask you before we wrapped up. And then we also do a sort of a, a couple of other uh, fun questions with all sure. of our guests as part of our listeners. Uh, but mine uh, is is quite hilarious, but I figure I might as well ask it. Uh, I'm a, uh, I am and still am a major fan of the TV show X-Files, you know, which is built around uh, a lot of uh, interesting uh uh, sort of themes and topics around uh, aliens and extraterrestrials and whatnot. Uh, in your personal opinion, um, do you think that there is intelligent life outside of human beings? Oh, gosh. Um, there's this famous Calvin and Hobbes <laughs> cartoon that says, I think the surest sign of intelligent life in the universe is that they haven't visited us yet. Um, it's a little bit, <laughs> it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, but there's actually scientific um, and mathematical models for this, like the Drake equation that say, well, here's probably here's a probability and here's why we may not have seen um, intelligent life yet. Um, I think, you know, to quote Jodie Foster in Contact, if, if we're alone, it's an awful waste of space. So I like to believe that there is intelligent life out there and that we just haven't found it yet. Cool. cool. Um, I think you also, did you also want to talk about sort of space and how it's depicted in Hollywood a bit? Are you, do you have time? Yeah, sure. Are you comfortable with yeah, that? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay. Yeah. And so, and this is kind of what we were chatting about pre-recording is um, I think the way we depict female astronauts in Hollywood needs to change. And maybe that's part of the reason that, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck in thinking, well, maybe there's a reason there's only 12%. Maybe women aren't as capable um, and when we look at movies like Gravity and, you know, the character um, depiction of Sandra Bullock is losing her cool, thinking she doesn't have this constantly neurotic, constantly, constantly anxious. Um, and whereas George Clooney swoops in and saves the day and is this cool, calm, collected veteran astronaut, um, you know, it's. Some may argue that it's just a rookie versus veteran scenario, but like, why constantly portray female astronauts as not having their wits about them when we have amazing models in real life, like Peggy Whitson, um, you know, like uh, Christina Cook, Jessica Mirror, like the list is endless of these women who are real life superheroes who obviously have what it takes. Some of them hold records as the, you know, most 
number of hours of EVA and, and spacewalk for any astronaut. Um, in their field. Um, and it's not just gravity. It's, uh, you know, Ad Astra, there was one female character who wasn't a main character who was constantly talked down to all by all the male characters. Um, the Martian had positive female representation. Jessica Shestin was the um, uh, crew commander. But again, it was a secondary role. You know, we, there are amazing women out there we need to see their biographies. We need to see their stories depicted on the big screen because, frankly, it's it's misrepresentation at this point. You know, Lucy in the Sky, and Lucy in the Sky was probably the most mm-hmm. egregious example. And Natalie Portman, you know, is a great actress, but when she portrayed this um, astronaut who would constantly, you know, put her own wants above what the mission needed, about what an astronaut needs, that's not that's not how astronauts roll. And so. Um, you know, Hollywood, if you're looking for a challenge, if you're looking for a great story, there are tons of female astronauts whose incredible stories are waiting to be told. Mae Jeminson, May Jeminson um, you know, Roberta Bondar. They're, they're yes. so many yes. And I want to see their stories. And, you know, um, you can see behind me, there's lots of biographies of amazing astronauts, but amazing male astronauts. And I'm slowly but surely starting to populate that bookshelf with amazing um, female authors, women in space, women in aviation. And the time has come. The time is now. So let's catalyze this. Let's inspire people with real life superheroes. And also your story. Your story would make a great Hollywood movie one day too, no? I think so. I think that's I great. feel like I'm just so. getting started. I uh, That's very kind of you to say. I have a lot of adventures in me yet. So uh, before we end, I have a two-part, very small question. So if you want to encompass, summarize what the future of space exploration is, how would you say that? And to tag along, what is the future of Dr. Shauna Pandya? Sure, yeah. Um, So the future of space exploration is accessibility, ambition, and inclusivity. Um, The future of me, um, I would say hopefully getting to space, um, hopefully contributing to a um, positive, permanent, off-world medical infrastructure for keeping astronauts and human explorers safe on the moon, on Mars, on beyond, and beyond. Awesome. awesome. Perfect. And on, on that note, thank you so much uh, for talking to us today. Uh, good luck. We'll watch your career with a lot of anticipation. Uh, and a lot of pride, and I hope to see you in space as well. And we'll be cheering Thank you, you so on much. here. Thanks again. This is wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Have yourself a Bye. great. Day. Have a great day. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed our episode. Your feedback is always appreciated. You can email us at futureof19 at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.ftrof.com as well as follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Future of 19. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Future Of. Please leave us your comments about what you liked, what you didn't, and what would you like to focus on future episodes. We'd love to hear from you. And lastly, if you are enjoying our episodes, if you enjoyed Season 1, looking forward to Season 2, please consider supporting us at Patreon at www.patreon.com slash futureof19. Thank you very much for your support and have yourself a wonderful day.